Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with you. Mike Ricksecker back with us. His latest book is called Travels Through Time. He's also the author of A Walk in the Shadows, A Complete Guide to Shadow People. He is a producer and director of the docuseries The Shadow Dimension, produces additional full-length content on ancient wisdom, lost civilizations, and the supernatural on his extensive YouTube channel, and for more than six years, he has hosted the Edge of the Rabbit Hole live stream show, also hosts the Connecting the Universe interactive class, operates his own book publishing and video production company called Haunted Road Media, his website linked up at Coast to Coast. He's got a full social media announcement, and we'll t go through that in a moment. Mike, welcome back. How have you been, buddy? <laughs> Doing pretty well. Thanks for having me back, George. I really appreciate I'm it. Looking forward to this. And this is a great book, by the way, Travels Through Time. Thank you. I I definitely appreciate that as well. This is uh, this has definitely been a passion project. What does time travel mean to you, Michael? Yeah, time travel to me is really a state of consciousness. It's a lot more than just you know jumping into a DeLorean with a flux capacitor like the old Back to the Future movie. Uh, this is actually you know we're talking more interdimensional type travel here when we're discussing time travel. Do you think it's going to be possible to really go back or forward in time? I do, and uh, more on the conscious level, level in which we will consciously be able to take ourselves to another point in time. I, I do believe that there are forms of time travel that are happening right now real, in a real subtle ways. Uh, you know, we could talk about time slips and things like that uh, throughout our time here this evening. So I, I do believe it's absolutely possible. The subtitle is Inside the Fourth Dimension, Time Travel, and Stacked Time Theory. What is the last part, Stacked Time Theory? Stacked Time Theory, absolutely. So this is an idea that uh, I've, I've been toying around with for some decades here. The idea that all time, and take a place where you are standing right now. Everything that has happened is happening and will happen are all happening concurrently. And you could take each of those moments like a photograph and stack them all up together. And that is your stack of time. And there are some times in which a couple of those moments will resonate at the same frequency and we'll get a little bit of a glimpse of each other. Now, when I first started putting these ideas together some time ago, you know, I started doing some research in the matter, and you know, came across that uh, you know, Albert Einstein had some similar ideas when talking about the space-time continuum, block universe, this sort of thing. And uh, I've just kind of taken it uh, another step here when we're talking about you know, personal res resonance, frequency, and vibration, where you know, we're resonating at a, a certain level in one of those moments within the stack. And I believe that somebody who knows how to tune their frequency correctly can be able to move up and down that stack. Mike, when we talk about time travel, is it conceivable that when we have deja vu events, we're time traveling? That is certainly a possibility. With deja vu, when these sorts of things come up, uh, a lot of times people will experience deja vu after uh, you know, some sort of dream that they've had. That uh, you know, Maybe they've had a dream about a location or a certain event, and it'll be somewhere down the road that they're actually at that location or experiencing that event. And, kind of scratches the back of their mind, like, wait a minute, this is, this is familiar. I've been here before. I've, I've done something like this before. And it may have been from a dream. Something that could also be from, you know, like a past life, that uh, this is, you know, someplace that they've been before in a past life. So 
um, when those moments come up, the consciousness within the person at some point had traversed to another point in time, experience of that, and then within the everyday vessel, all of a sudden remembers that that moment has happened before. What are time slips, Michael? At time slips, this is kind of what I was referring to earlier. When you have those uh, two moments, those two photos within the stack that are resonating at uh, a bit of the same frequency, and we get to see a glimpse of one of these. A um, good example of this is uh, my good friend Andrea Perrin, who grew up in what's known as the Conjuring House, a farmhouse in oh, that's right. uh, yeah. Yeah, Harrisville, Rhode Island, that the movie The Conjuring was based off of. And let's say whatever you want about all the hauntings and things like that that happened there, but uh, she'll even tell you that the most significant thing that happened there, and they experienced things there for 10 years, uh, the most significant thing that happened to her and the family was there was one particular evening that um, her mother had woken up been asleep, was hungry, wanted some coffee. Uh, Andrew was helping her out, uh, you know, get those things. And all of a sudden, as Carolyn was sitting in the parlor, she was looking into the dining room area, and all of a sudden, morphing into existence in the dining room, was this 17th century family. It's a woman cooking over the hearth, a couple of kids running so around. They were just was, there, right? They were, yeah, yeah, they just suddenly appeared. There was a couple of gentlemen sitting at the table. They turned and looked at Carolyn as if she was the ghost. And one gentleman said to the other, well, you look at that, looking at Carolyn. So, and then the, the moment uh, dissipated away. But this here is a type of a time slip in which Carolyn could see a moment in the past, but the past was able to see a moment in the future as well. Now, doppelgangers, aren't they supposed to be duplicates of ourselves? Yes, these are duplicates of ourselves, but um, I think they kind of get a little misconstrued. We, we go down the whole, you know, evil twin route. Um, you know, sometimes people go down the whole <laughs> Hollywood lookalike thing, but um, really you, you have some fascinating stories here throughout history. Uh, the one that I like to point to, and there are several, one that I like to point to is the famous poet Goethe. Now, one day, he's headed down the, the road toward Jolfenheim. This is in Germany. And on the side of the road, he sees walking this man in this really interesting uh, gold-trimmed gray suit. And he's looking at this gentleman, admiring the suit. All of a sudden, the gentleman disappears right in front of him. Like, wow, that's really bizarre. Years later... He's walking down that same road in the opposite direction. He, he gets around to that same spot, looks down, and he realizes, oh, my gosh, I'm wearing that gold-trimmed gray suit. I'm the man that I saw disappear. So what happened was is he had actually had an interaction with himself. It was almost like a type of time slip, like we were talking about before, where he had his... Uh, consciousness, consciousness had crossed that same location, tuned into the same frequency between those two different moments in time. Is it a parallel universe, Mike? Parallel universe is, you know, this is interesting. Uh, this is something that's actually uh, come up quite a bit uh, within our scientific community here. Uh, down in Antarctica, you have uh, the Ice Cube Project, the Anita Project, and the results that have been coming back from these uh, neutrinos down at the South Pole have been acting in a very bizarre fashion, uh, basically the reverse of the way they're supposed to be working. And you've had scientists coming forward saying, we have a parallel universe running in reverse time. And what's funny to me is when this notion was first suggested some years back, coming out some more tabloid-esque type of journals and you know, the uh, mainstream uh, traditionalists were kind of laughing it off. But this was actually uh, came out now in a peer-reviewed scientific paper earlier this year. You know, this is a legitimate study in which, yes, yeah, a parallel universe running in a reverse time, which <laughs> then it gives, gets one scratch in their head. Okay, what would something like that look like? A, 
a universe running in reverse time. And um, I've taken this, uh, looking at our uh, ancient symbolism, I, I think this is symbolized within the Ouroboros, the snake eating its own tail, which is a symbol of constant renewal and recycle. And if you look at the version uh, by Theodore uh, Pelicanos from the 1400s, which is actually a copy of the alchemical track from uh, the uh, early 300 AD, uh, era, and you see you know, duality that is uh, shown within there. So these are the the two universes, and when the uh, that moment where the snake eats its own tail, this is the moment of those two universes coming together. You know, ours and the one running in reverse, and this is actually a symbol of uh, the Big Bang, the moment of creation. And so then the question is. You know, what was before the universe? Well, the universe was, and the universe will be after us, too. It's just going to be constructed a little bit differently as those elements. Basically, uh, you have the explosion of the Big Bang. The universe expands, then contracts again into another Big Bang. We're talking with Mike Ricksecker, whose latest book is called Travels Through Time. He's also got another one called A Walk in the Shadows. We'll talk to him about that later on in the program as well. He's on full social media. You've got a number of websites too, Mike, don't you? Uh, I do, yeah. Uh, Javadimension.com, that's the uh, website for the docuseries. And then ConnectedUniversePortal.com, that is for my online learning portal. Is it conceivable that time travelers from the future, a hundred years, a thousand years, have come back here to where we are now? Yeah, this is certainly uh, conceivable, and I find it fascinating uh, when we look at some of the extraterrestrial sightings, some of these UAPs, and the suggestion has been uh, thrown out there that oh, some of these are not uh, extraterrestrials, but some of these may actually be ourselves from the future. And, uh, you know, that's, it's very conceivable that, uh, that these could be travelers from the future that, uh, you know, that are interacting with us. Perhaps there's a technology that they've lost, uh, something that they need to learn from this time frame that they need to take back with them to the future. Why well, come back to the year 2000? Go back all the way to the beginning, right? <laughs> right. Well, and they could be doing that, too. Yeah. When we look at... Uh, People have experienced something called the Mandela effect from time to time. And That's a weird it, feeling, isn't it? it? It really is. And, and yeah, there's some fun ones uh, that people point out where uh, we uh, you know, have a different recollection of uh, branding on a, you know, a, a package of, of cereal or something like that. And that's kind of fun. But there are some more legitimate accounts of this type of effect, uh, events around the world that uh, many people from all over the globe will point to you know, no connection with each other and say, no, that was remembered a different way. And they're all, re, you know, quote, unquote, misremembering it. They're all misremembering it the same way. So there's something there. There's something in our past has been changed. And a, you know, a number of people are remembering whatever that was prior to the change. Explain, Michael, the Mandela effect to people. Yeah, absolutely. That's you know, really what we were just kind of uh, talking about here. But this really got uh, coined uh, when Nelson Mandela uh, it passed away here about 10 years ago. And there were many, many people who had, uh, had a memory of him passing away when he was in prison in the 1980s. And so this is why it became dubbed the Mandela Effect, because of all these people that had remembered this so differently. And you know, this is a very strange effect. Again, this is, and it's not that necessarily intentionally a time traveler is going back in time to change the specific event that you are remembering differently. They could be going back in time, touching or interacting with something else, and the repercussions from that result in this new, what you would call a false memory. Why is it that so many people have these false memories during the Mandela effect. Uh, some people are able to retain those memories. Others, the, the change takes hold. I, I think it's um, 
you know, people who are a little bit more in tune to, uh, to the universe. You, we could talk about a higher vibrational level, that sort of thing. Um, but I think what it is is, uh, you know, people whose consciousness is a little bit more aware of uh, changes to the nature of the universe are more in tune to those changes or able to maintain some of those memories before the time change happens. Do you remember that original movie called The Time Machine? I am familiar with it, but I do not remember a whole lot about it. It's one of the classics. You've got to rent it if you can find it. Yeah. I mean, it's just... I, I will. I certainly will. You know, a lot of, you know, the, the movie that influenced me a lot uh, with this particular work was Somewhere in Time with Christopher Reeve and James. That was a classic. Yes, absolutely. That that one really touched me when I was a kid. and um, Great music, and, too. Oh, yes, yeah. The, the soundtrack by John Barry is amazing. Um, but the idea that he could will his consciousness just by convincing himself that he was in the year 1912, to will his consciousness back to another point in time, I believe is really more of how time travel would work rather than getting in a machine. You know, theoretical physics tells us that, well, if we got near a black hole, uh, you know, time would work differently. Well, we're not getting near a black hole anytime soon. Uh, but what we do have is ourselves, our own consciousness. And uh, I believe that if we can train our consciousness to be able to tune into a different frequency, a different moment in that stack of time that we were talking about earlier, then we could conceivably will our consciousness to that other point in time and be able to experience it. Mike, have you ever seen that picture? It's a black and white photo taken in the 1800s when they had the ability to take those pictures of a guy in a mixed crowd with what looks like a cell phone to his ear. It's the most bizarre thing you'll ever see. Did you ever see that? Yeah, there are some interesting out-of-place photographs like that. I do cover a couple of those within the book. And, uh, yeah, those, are, those photographs are, are pretty fun. Some of them have some, uh, yeah, some logical explanations to it, but other ones are really head scratches like that and don't really make a lot of sense. And even the ones that you know, some people are able to kind of excuse away, like, yeah, that's really kind of stretching it. So, yeah, we, we could actually have some of these time travelers on film, in a photograph from another point in time. How many of uh, us's do you think there could be in the future? Uh, you know, the idea of uh, multiple versions of us running around uh, is certainly conceivable. Uh, you could, you know, it could also be part of the, uh, the multiverse, and you could have versions of us from other universes running around. Um, yeah, you know, when it comes to this realm of research, you can put a lot of these different possibilities on the table and make a case for any of them. That's a, it's truly remarkable. Where do people get your book, Travels Through Time? Uh, you can find that at my website, uh, MikeRicksegger.com. It's also available now on sites like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and you know, other retailers. Great cover, by the way. Looks like a time machine all by itself, doesn't it? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's really colorful. I like it. Who did that for you? Um, I had a uh, I had an artist off of um, oh, it was what was it? It was a deposit photos artist. I forget. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Um, well, he did a great job. He did do a great job, and I added a little bit of the uh, the text to that. Tell me your involvement with shadow people, Michael. Yeah, sure, George. Uh, this goes back a ways for me. I uh, had a lot of experiences with shadow entities, uh, but it goes all the way back to when I was about uh, eight years old, woke up in the middle of the night one night, and there was this tall, dark shadow standing in the corner of my bedroom. Uh, of course, I had no idea at the time that it was a you know, shadow person or shadow entity or whatever you want to call the thing. You know, I thought there was just an intruder in the house, somebody that had broken in and was there to either rob the place or killed me. That's you know, what I thought Jeez. at that age. Um, but of course, you know, that didn't happen. I'm still alive to tell the tale, which is great. Um, but it did do something very unusual. 
this thing uh, approached my bed, leaned over, and I'm staring at this blank black face. There's nothing there, no eyes, no nose, no mouth, nothing. Uh, and it did something really unusual. It grabbed me by the wrist, crossed my arms across my body, and then ran down the hall. Um, at that point in time, found my voice, found my, found my legs, ran off screaming in my parents' bedroom. And, you know, they're nice, kind parents trying to console me, calm me down, uh, trying to tell me I just had a bad dream. But you know, I knew I hadn't had a bad dream. This was something I was very much awake for. And uh, since then, I've had several... Uh, you know, occasions with uh, with shadow entities have come up in my investigations quite a bit, and uh, so this was a, a topic that, uh, along the course of my uh, research and career, that I, that I definitely wanted to cover. Do they have they ever been known to hurt people? Um, some have, sure. It, I mean, it's really a, a mix uh, because they these things are a variety of different things. Uh, you know, some are just you know, human spirits that can't fully manifest as an ap- apparition. Many are interdimensional beings of, of a variety of sorts. Some are extraterrestrials. Some are some are time slips, like we were talking about earlier, uh, yeah. with, with travels through time. So, um, so yeah, you're going to have ones that are uh, a little bit more nefarious in, in nature. You're going to have ones that are, are benevolent, actually. Uh, but most are just watching, observing, staring. Uh, collecting information about us. Are they different from the hat man phenomenon? Uh, yeah, the, the hat man, uh, again, this is, uh, it can be a variety of different things. Um, you know, some people, uh, you know, think that they are, uh, you know, maybe disguising themselves as humans. Uh, some people think that the hat may be some sort of technology. Uh, I like to point to the story of, uh, of Albert K. Bender in the 1950s, in which uh, he had a experience with. Uh, he was he was the individual that founded the International Flying Saucer Bureau in 1952 during the big UFO flap, and it was an organization that he blew up big. Had uh, offices around the world within the first year. Back in a time when it was really difficult to uh, communicate across uh, overseas like that, but he was able to blow it up big. And in a year's time, all of a sudden he shut the thing down. And nobody really understood why. But about 10 years later, he wrote a book called Flying Saucers and the Three Men. And what he described is that he walked into his room one evening after work. And as he entered the room, through the wall materialized these three dark, shadowy, hat-wearing beings with glowing eyes smelling of sulfur. Now, according to Bender, these were extraterrestrials that were on a resource mission, collecting resources, down in Antarctica. And he was instructed not to say anything about them, to stop his research, and uh, not say anything about them until they were done with their research mission years later. Now, somebody like me, when I was doing uh, you know, paranormal, a lot more paranormal research at the time, I hear the story, and I'm thinking, well, this, you know, these are the hat men. These are the you know, shadowy beings that we always uh, hear about. Other people hear the story and say, well, these are the men in black. And to me, it's like, well, it kind of just really depends on the lens that you view it through as to which one you believe it is. Are any of these, whether they're hat people or shadow people, Michael, are they demonic? Uh, a handful, sure, will, will be demonic. Um, again, these, these can be a variety of different things. So you know, while you do have... Uh, the demonic kind, you can have ones that uh, certainly aren't demonic. You know, somebody's you know, Aunt Tessie that comes into the uh, room at night is, uh, you know, you know it's basically just a human spirit and is only manifesting as a shadow, certainly is not going to be demonic. But uh, but you do have some that are, sure. Well, with Mike Ricksecker, his uh, books are available to you through his websites and on Amazon.com as well. He appears on Gaia TV. He was a guest on Beyond Belief. You can search for that as well. You've been on Ancient Aliens with all of us, haven't you? I have been, yes. I've been on a handful of Ancient Aliens episodes talking about talking about this, Shadow People, also talking uh, the Alaska Triangle, which uh, I was on Beyond Belief uh, with you for that, and uh, some other topics as well. And uh, just, 
just got uh, back from L.A. today filming uh, another episode. So, um, yeah, I've been uh, quite busy lately. It's been hot here, hasn't it? Yes, it was quite hot and a little on the humid side. Actually. Very humid, strangely humid. Yeah. Since you've been doing this, and you've been doing this for years now, what has been the most satisfying thing you have done? Uh, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. And I think, you know, really what it comes down to is, uh, you know, helping others and passing on knowledge. You know, we're, we're all in this together. We're all experiencing strange phenomena, seeing things, witnessing things, uh, interacting with uh, whether it's other beings or, you know, other strange phenomena that's going on in the house or uh, you know, maybe even with our kids or something like that. And, you know, people, people want answers. They want to understand. And, you know, it's just my hope that, you know, the, the bit of knowledge that I've been able to put out there uh, is able to help people. And uh, I think one of the biggest things that, you know, we're here to do, aside from uh, you know, love others, is to pass knowledge on to the next generation. You know, I, I can't take all of all of what I've done with me. So, um, you know, and and you can't make the other generation uh, take up that mantle, but you hope that they do, and that um, you know this cycle that humanity seems to find itself on. Uh, you know, at some point in time, we can actually push forward rather than uh, keeping within you know, that vicious cycle we seem to be on. So, you know. To, pass on knowledge and help others. Michael, do people summon up the shadow people, the hat person, or do they just show up on their own? Uh, really it really comes down to the, the type of shadow again. Um, I, I, some people do try to summon that up. You know, maybe they're, uh, they've got some sort of spirit circle going on. Maybe they're doing some candle work. Maybe they're using a Ouija board. Um, so you do see people do that sort of thing. Uh, some of them just show up like the the one that showed up in my house when when i was a kid it just it came up out of nowhere and it wasn't a haunted house or anything like that that was a that was a one-off there was a another house that i moved into later on where there was a there was some shadow activity there for a couple of months but again that one was more at the house showed up um yeah i had a hypnotic regression here a couple of years ago now to dive a little bit more into that uh to find out what that shadow was and what we got out of that hypnotic regression was that uh, this thing was from another dimension. It was interesting because it said that it was from another space. And we asked the question, well, you know, would you call it another dimension? And it responded with, well, you might call it another dimension, but really it's another space. And what it was doing was that it was um, you know, coming from its dimension into ours to do research on humanity, and that particular night had chosen the home in which there was a little boy sleeping uh, to, to watch and observe and didn't realize uh, that I had woken up and saw it until you know, I started reacting to it. So, um, so that would be one right there where you know, not summoned, it just showed up. But people do try to summon these things, yes. Is there an exercise if you want to get involved with these things? Um, I mean, I guess what that would come down to is, you know, you're going to have people that are skilled in a variety of different areas, sure. whether it's, um, doing something like a, like a Ouija board. Like I, I don't recommend just, you know, launching yourself into using something like that. There are people that are skilled in using, using it the proper way. Uh, so uh, you know, there are people that you can seek that might have that knowledge to be able to do something like that. Um, but really what I think this comes down to is kind of like what we were talking about before with the, uh, the time travel, personal resonance, frequency, and vibration. You know, some people are able to see uh, more shadows and apparitions, and others are able to see more apparitions and shadows. And that has to do with the way that the, the frequency and personal resonance of your body is tuned in that you, know, you are you are more in tune to certain types of uh, entities and activities than other things. You've been on the Travel Channel for their show on the Alaska Triangle. You've written a book called Alaska's Mysterious Triangle. What is this thing, Mike? Now, the Alaska Triangle is really, uh, it, it's like the Bermuda Triangle but in Alaska. And we really have a lot of these 
uh, different triangle areas uh, around the world. Alaska, uh, Bermuda, of course, is the famous one, the Dragon's Triangle out near Japan, and many, many others. Uh, it, it really, uh, you know, Ivan T. Sanderson had his vile vortices, and a number of these triangle areas can be found uh, you know, where he designated those vile vortices at. And really what these areas are, uh, you have that uh, magnetic energy coming out of the Earth's core, and as it passes through different metals and minerals within the Earth, it interacts with those and creates uh, different magnetic fields. And some of these become very, very strong, very, very powerful, and have an adverse effect on things within that particular area, and that's where we get these uh, triangle areas from. That's amazing work that you do. I mean, it's it's fantastic. Have you ever been hurt? Uh, well, by any of this supernatural activity, I don't know if I would say if I've been hurt. I mean, I did have the one, uh, you know, get physical with me that crossed my arms. It didn't hurt, though. Uh, you know, the, the way it felt was just like anybody else would touch me, but it didn't really hurt. Um, it wasn't so. trying to hurt you, was it? I, no, it, it wasn't. When, when it did that, like I said, we had that, uh, we did that hypnotic regression. Uh, when it did that, it was actually trying to put me into a self-hug. Now, when it, when it first happened to me when I was a kid, I was scared out of my mind. I did think it was hurting me. But coming to understand after, after the hypnosis session that um, when it realized that uh, it had scared me, that it, it wasn't trying to do that. So really it was just trying to uh, give me a self-hug. I actually got to see from that perspective that it actually patted me on the wrist, too, to, almost like a comforting type of a thing, and then got out of there uh, to, to stop frightening me. So um, so that's probably the, the closest I've been to hurt. And other investigations I've done has been more of like, you know, <laughs> You know, physical type of things, you know, going into abandoned buildings and things like that. There's, there's dangers like that that have nothing to do with the supernatural and more physical in nature. Mike's on social media. He's on Facebook, Instagram. I guess we used to call it Twitter. Now, what do we call it, X? I guess we call it X now, yeah. <laughs> How bizarre. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. You uh, pay $44 billion for the equity in a company, and then you change the name. Yeah, to a single letter. To a single letter. It's crazy. <laughs> It really is. Travels Through Time is the incredible new book. And you even have a little episode with uh, Michio Kaku in there, don't you? I do, yes. I love Michio's work. I've, uh, He's a genius. He really is. And the way he presents it, you know, he, he brings it down to a, a really nice, comfortable level that, so that all that information is not just totally over your head. Um, he uses a lot of uh, references to science fiction in his work, and so it's uh, really wonderful the way he presents everything. And uh, yeah, where I, I reference uh, Michio is in his description of of dimensions. And he and I on uh, Ancient Aliens in uh, one particular episode uh, had a little uh, back and forth that they set up uh, when we we described dimensions and uh, the way those work. And his his example, I remember I said he kind of like you know, really gives those uh, nice examples that aren't too far over your head. Um, when he's talking about dimensions above ours, he uses the example of fish in a pond. And he's like, okay, imagine in the pond, uh, that's a two-dimensional world, and that's where the fish live. Where if you were to take the fish out of the pond, he's like, you know, imagine we are, you know, we are the fish. You take the fish out of the pond into this greater world that they've never seen before. They had no idea. It would you know, totally blow their mind as to what they would see. Well, that would be the same for us if you pulled us from our fourth dimension to the fifth. What, you know, what would we see? You know, we would see you know, time as a physical construct. Because you know, right now we're, tap we're trapped in what we call the river of time. Uh, but if you come out of that to the fifth dimension, you see time as a physical object, which is absolutely amazing. What did Einstein say about time? Einstein, in his dying days in 1955, said that time is an illusion. And that, of course, you know, plays right into what we're, we're talking about here, that you know, time is just a human construct. It was 
uh, you know, devised to describe our reality. You know, it's, a, it's, it's a tool that, that we use you know, to help plant the crops, to be able to you know, get to work at the right moment so our bosses don't get upset, that sort of thing. Uh, but it's also something that, you know, because of that, uh, you know, we've become a slave to. Uh, but, you know, time is, is just that, just a human construct. It does not really exist. And because it does not really exist and it's something that humans made, that means it's also something that we can overcome and we can actually uh, discover the true nature of. His latest book is called Travels Through Time. Mike, you devote a chapter to dreams in the time book. Tell me about that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, dreams is a way that we can tap into other moments in time. Of course, you know, uh, with the future, with premonitory dreams, that's uh, where people are able to uh, tap into that a lot. Um, you know, when we when we enter the dream state, we have these different you know different brainwave patterns, and uh, they were able to tap into other elements of the universe, like the collective unconscious, which is something, uh, you know, Carl Jung taught us about years ago, that there's, you know, information out there that you know, we can we can tap into and, you know, glean some insights into the uh, universe, maybe the different skill set. Uh, you know, you, you see in the past how, kind of ironically, uh, a whole bunch of people from all across the world no contact with each other, start inventing the same thing. Uh, you know, why was that? So, uh, yeah, de- definitely during our dream state, we can uh, tap into knowledge of the future. Mike, if you were a parent and a kid came up to you, your kid, and said, uh, Mommy, Daddy, I'm having these strange dreams of these strange shadow people, what do you take of that? Yeah, uh, absolutely, because that's something that, uh, you know, I, I did have to deal with as a, as a child myself, of course. You know, my kids, uh, you know, they had their share of, of bad dreams and things like that. Um, but, you know, with, with me, I was actually experiencing things. And I thought my, my parents handled it a good way. You know, you want your child to feel safe. You know, that's, you know, that's key number one, make your child feel safe. So uh, with, with my parents, you know, they, of course, tried to tell me I had a bad dream, even though I didn't. Fortunately, that was just, you know, one incident that happened. Uh, when I was a little bit older and we had moved into a different house and I started seeing these shadows uh, you know, quite a bit, and basically what was happening is I was in my bedroom unpacking boxes, putting things away, and I kept seeing this shadowy figure in my doorway. And any time I turned and looked, he'd run off, uh, you know, down the hall. You know, different than that first one, he was more translucent and things like that, where the first one I had interacted with was very solid. And after that happening several times over the course of like the first week that we were in that house, I finally decided to ask my mom about you know what I was seeing. And I was 13 years old at the time; I was a little bit older. Um, but she had admitted she had seen the thing too. Uh, and it was great for me in a couple different ways. One, uh, you know, I, I wasn't crazy. You know, here is mom admitting that she had seen the same thing too. It was affirmation. And then two, she was really. Um, she said it in a really disarming manner. You know, she wasn't you know overly concerned. She wasn't panicked about it. You know, she was very very calm. And so it's like, okay, mom see, has seen the same thing too. She's not alarmed about it, so there's nothing for me to worry about apparently. So I got playful with this thing and started calling him Tom, like peeping Tom, uh, because he'd peep in my room and then I'd say you know hi and he'd take off. So um, so that became kind of a uh, a playful thing there for a few months until he uh, he eventually just disappeared. So I, I chalked it up to uh, you know something that was there at the house when we moved in, checking out the new family, seeing that we were okay, and he went about his business. Tell us about the Connecting the Universe interactive class that you have. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a, a class that I run on uh, Wednesday nights, eight o'clock p.m. Eastern time, and you know we we dive into a lot of different supernatural, esoteric topics, ancient wisdom, these sorts of things, and on time travel. Uh, we do a lot on, uh, like, ancient Egypt, the Stargates, like you and I were talking about there a couple weeks ago, uh, Beyond Belief. And, um, you know, with the uh, Connecting Universe portal side of it, this is a, you know, back into a lot more information that, that goes along with the class. Uh, there's a lot of... Uh, 
you know, like video blogs, there's you know behind the scenes information, a lot of articles, uh, this sorts of uh, these sorts of things that are complementary to the class. Mike, have you ever experienced the old hag syndrome? Uh, I've experienced the where it has felt like the the pressure on my chest, uh, but I've have not had the experience of, of the hag in conjunction to something say on my chest. And in those cases, it felt more like something was trying to. Uh, like push inside of me, and uh, but you do have people that report that you know they feel the pressure on the chest. They wake up, they've got the hag sitting there, or some sort of ghoul. Uh, I had one person uh, tell me a story that they woke up and there was a dire wolf on their chest, and uh, her her husband is her thrashing around trying to get the dire wolf off her. Uh, woke him up. He turned around, looked at her. He didn't see the wolf himself, but what he saw. Uh, were the paw prints, the impressions of the paw prints on our shoulders. So, uh, yeah, this is a very, very interesting uh, phenomenon that goes you know, all the way back into ancient times. Thousands of years people have been reporting this phenomenon. The bottom line is, though, I don't think we can go back and change time, can we? Well, I think that the changes in time become more more subtle in nature, at least with what we've, we've seen. You know, when we talk about things like the... Uh, uh, Mandela effect, which the the one uh, question there was about, you know, who coined that was uh, Fiona Broom. Um, you know, when when that happens, it, it seems to be some you know smaller type items uh, that seem to get affected. The bigger items, it, it doesn't seem like that's the case. But you know, when those changes happen, you know, how much of of the original do we remember? Apparently some of us do remember some of those original events, but is it only these smaller ones or is it the bigger ones? It, it's such an, uh, an area uh, with, with a lot of abstract qualities to it, and we're still trying to figure these things out. Michael, tell po- folks where they can get your books. Yeah, absolutely. You can find my books, MikeRicksecker.com. Also, you know, your favorite online outlet, uh, Amazon.com, uh, Barnes & Noble, uh, you can find it in brick-and-mortar stores there as well if they've uh, ordered the book and stocked it. What did you think of the congressional hearing on UFOs last week? That was really interesting. Uh, I enjoyed watching that. And, um, you, know, you know, really a, a lot of the information, and this is what I've been telling people, is that you know, this is information that we've known. You know, our community has known about these things for decades. And I think it was absolutely wonderful that in a setting here before Congress that we are now officially writing these things into the record. This is, this is no longer something that people can laugh at our community about or anything like that. No, this is something we're actually discussing with Congress, and they're taking it seriously. So that was absolutely wonderful to see that happen. And the three ex-military people were no-nonsense, very serious people. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're talking about, you know, a couple of fighter pilots and then uh, Grush there is, you know, he was in some you know, very intelligence. You know, yeah, intelligence uh, community there. So, uh, yeah, you know, that was wonderful to have individuals like that to, to testify before Congress. Tell me what you think of lost time. What causes that where people just lose time? Yeah, you find the uh, lost time phenomenon a lot of times with uh, with UFO abductions and you know, all of a sudden, you know, 30 minutes, an hour will go by. Um, you have know, Travis Walton who lost days. You know, this sort of thing uh, happens. And the thing that, uh, you know, that I question about that is, you know, sure, um, you know, they could, you know, lose consciousness for that amount of time. But if you have uh, some of these entities that are outside uh, the scope of time, some of these interdimensional beings, when they... You know, say they abduct a human, uh, are they actually taking that human out of the river of time as well into that uh, fifth dimension and, or it could even be another dimension beyond uh, to do whatever it is that they are doing when you know, they come back here? Again, it, it could be something that to them seems like you know, five minutes and you know, is really to, you know, here back on Earth days. And, uh, you know, in our modern context, we see this, uh, again, with the UFO abductions. But when you start looking back uh, throughout history, you find these same reports in things like 
fairy lore and other mm-hmm. uh, mythology and things like that. So it seems like this is a phenomenon that's been occurring for a really long time, but is described in the context of the era. How many people self-hypnotize where they go from point A to point B, they don't recall how to get there? Yeah, I mean, that <laughs> that can almost kind of happen sometimes when we're driving down the road and we're going down a familiar stretch of road. And, right. You know, that, that can certainly happen. Um, so, uh, so sure, things, things like that can happen too. But when, when that happens, a lot of people report seeing uh, strange things within that. That almost kind of takes them out of the... Uh, hypnotism sometimes, you know, they'll, they'll be kind of zoned out and all of a sudden they'll, they'll see something strange or odd or some strange event will happen that, that will snap them out of that. And, you know, Michael, we haven't talked about Slender Man. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, we have not yet talked about Slender Man. Uh, Slender Man, what's interesting about this is it started off, you know, we, we can trace the origins you know, back to uh, the, the mid-2000s and this was actually part of a Photoshop contest. So he started off as a fictional being. And, uh, you know, a couple of images that were submitted for this contest, uh, he included some different lines of lore, you know, some little story that went along with it, which, you know, people loved. They jumped right on top of it. Of course, he had these, you know, creepy photos with this character in there. And so he created some more. Other people started creating similar photos and adding legend and lore do this whole thing, so they you know, it basically became an online urban legend. But um, some people believe that there was enough uh, energy put behind all of this creativity into this being that uh, what we would call a tulpa or a sentient thought form was created out of this and has now become a real Slender Man character that is out there and about. Mike, what would you recommend to people who? might have shadow people experiences, time travel warps. What do they do? Where do they go? Yeah, yeah I would uh, recommend, especially with the, uh, the the shadow person phenomenon, because a lot of people um, you know, get frightened of that, and I understand it. It's, you know, uh, you know, they're, they're dark and strange, and people tend to fear what they don't understand and that sort of thing. So um, you know, I would reach out to somebody local in the area that you know, has, uh, you know, a lot more knowledge in that area. You know, if you go surfing around the internet, you're going to find, you know, a, a thousand different ideas and a thousand different, you know, methodologies of, of what to do. But, um, you know, there, there are going to be people in your area that have been, you know, working in this field for decades, and they will have expertise to be able to help out in that situation, uh, maybe come in and investigate a little bit, you know, find out you know, what specifically is going on, because, again, all these things are are a little bit different. Absolutely. Mike, thanks for being on the program. His book is called Travels Through Time. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.